We're good? Oh, we still don't have the audio, right? Oh, okay. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, I am Rolando. I, uh, a few years ago, actually two years ago, I brought to the uh, Pinball Expo a uh, crazy <laughs> challenge that I put onto myself, which was uh, to essentially build um, Black Knight completely from scratch. I, I, I said to me, I, I, I want to see how far can I go without uh, buying standard parts. I had some challenges regarding this because I obviously things like the thumper bumper, uh, the drop cards and some other things, I, I had to buy them. There were like a, a molded plastic, so uh, the flippers too, right? So anyways, uh, I am very good at, uh, with computers <laughs> and software, but I wasn't so good at mechanical stuff, so I had uh, a few uh, um, efforts through the way, uh, learning, you know. Um, I had to learn how to cut metal, um, uh, and obviously not, not having a mechanical engineering background, uh, I wasn't sure how to do many of those things. Anyways, the video that you're seeing is actually the machine that I built. I just want to, to show you that actually exists. <laughs> uh, I, I could not bring it, but, uh, any, uh, but I brought it in 2021 to the expo. Um, so, uh, because I, I was uh, set on this idea that I had to build everything myself, the very first thing that I built was a CNC machine, which is the machine that you see there. Uh, that machine I used to uh, make the, uh, uh, the, the obviously the play field. I, I cut all the metal parts, all the brackets, everything. I had to use obviously aluminum because uh, uh, that machine, that CNC machine only cuts uh, soft materials like uh, wood and, and soft aluminum. So that's what I, um, I had to, you know, <laughs> it took me two years from the point that I actually started to make all these things to the, the point that I actually finished all these uh, additional tools. Uh, also, I had to uh, build a machine to make coils because you don't have pinballs unless you have coils. And this is the first, uh, uh, that machine has had some improvements over the years. Obviously, it's not uh, looking like that, but I, I, I didn't took a picture actually to I didn't take a picture to bring it here, so that's uh, the way that it started. And the play field, the first uh, look of the play field is that thing that you see there. So essentially, I um, I I, uh, I used a bitmap of uh, a virtual pinball uh, Black Knight, and I I sort of uh, I used a program called Inkscape. I traced all the uh, the, the bitmap turned into vector, and I used that to print a, mylar, um, a vinyl surface that I put onto the, the play fill. Uh, I was able to find um, inserts that were white for everything because I wanted to use uh, RGB lights, not uh, white uh, lights with color uh, lens. I couldn't find these last three ones um, in transparent color. Uh, they were orange. So I managed to use everything. Um, I molded, I used silicone to mold, uh, where is it? Oh, there was a picture with, uh, ah, it doesn't matter. I made a mold with silicone of the, of the piece of here, it is. No, it's not. Um, and I, I recreated the, uh, the lens using uh, epoxy. Uh, Epoxy resin. So, anyways, you saw you saw the video and uh, you saw the play field, and the story goes like um, I bring the I bring this machine to the expo, and the machine has a, a, a few failures. Well, while well it's here, mostly because of uh, some bad designs that I, I did on the electronics. Uh, so I corrected the electronics. Uh, so this is the one of the intermediate boards that actually put together. So each one of these, uh, if you're familiar with electronics, uh, these are the connections uh, to the solenoids. Uh, this is the process that I'm using. Um, 
uh, and uh, everything uh, evolved so that the machine now is, is working 100%, it's flawless. Uh, that was uh, a process that took uh, some months to find all the errors and all the problems. And now, after that, it came, okay, so, uh, so I, I accomplished that objective. What comes now? Because I like to keep challenging myself on doing these things. I said, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start making uh, the life of the people that make machines easier. Because one of the things that I, I faced uh, during the time that I was building this machine uh, was a lot of things that I, I found out that my fellow uh, homebrewers also had. And uh, there were several things that were not just uh, easy. Uh, one of them was finding parts, exactly what I wanted. Uh, another thing was the cost. Things were very, very expensive. Another thing was the way to make the, the wiring, the harnesses. There was a lot of different type of connections, a lot of different tools I had to use, the wiring um, ends in connectors of different types. So uh, what can I do to make all these things better? That's, that's what you came up to, what I have today that I'm going to introduce to you. So essentially, um, if you're actually building a pinball machine, you probably know something about 3D printing. You understand how uh, three models for um, uh, making a play field works, uh, even if you uh, have that background knowledge, uh, you probably uh, will understand how to build a, a 3D model of a mechanism that you want to use and so on and so forth. So, uh, uh, or uh, if you have access uh, to certain tools, you can make these parts yourself. Uh, for, uh, for instance, if you have access to a 3D printer, you can make many of the parts uh, for the pinball machine. If you pay attention to some of the machines that we have, that the, the Expo has in the, in the floor, uh, there are several companies that actually have 3D printing parts above uh, the play field that you can see directly. So there, there are many pinball, other pinball companies don't like to do that. They actually have 3D printed parts underneath the play field. Uh, 3D printed uh, parts are not uh, something that has a great reputation. Uh, but it's wrong. It's, uh, people think that th they may break, but actually it depends on the direction of how you do the print. The other thing is, to make parts, you need to access to a water jet cutter or a laser metal cutter. Or you have to have access to a CNC machine. You need to have access to a coil making machine. Uh, if you don't have anything of these tools, which most of the people don't, you can go to a place called a makerspace. Makerspaces have all these elements. And I think that uh, uh, there's in Chicago a few of them. I, I, I checked that. So let me show you first um, what are the, the components that you can make yourself. You can make all the mechanisms and you can make all the electronics that you're going to put in your machine. Everything that you go underneath the play field, you can make it. I mean, it's, it's, it takes more effort. So you can make flipper mechanisms, you can make the whole eject mechanisms, you can make three ball locks, uh, ball troughs, uh, a bumper, slingshots, lane switchers, uh, uh, infrared barriers, uh, drop targets, inline drop targets. You can make sensors. You can simplify the harness and you can make the control electronics. And if you do that, you're going to have less work, actually. S some of the... Um, design philosophy that I came up with uh, actually brings you less work. Other thing that I mentioned is the cost. If you look at the cost, uh, I don't know if you can see the prices, but uh, for instance, a full flipper assembly is around 50 bucks. Same thing, with, uh, same cost for the bumper. Uh, more expensive for a single drop target. A $90, $90 for a bank, for a three drop target bank. $300 for a three drop target bank that has the uh, smart, uh, that they can drop the targets and raise them again. Uh, $189 for a ball trough. Um, and, so on and, so and so on and so forth. There's a lot of prices that I took here from the main uh, pinball parts manufacturer that home brewers uh, can get their parts from. Uh, and this is the less expensive, okay? So you're going to find from these prices up. 
Uh, and there's things that you cannot find. I mean, you cannot find a pre-made three-ball lock mechanism. You cannot find a four-in-line drop targets. L these are things that are not of interest to the, the uh, they don't have enough uh, volume of sales, so you cannot find them. So you may have to make them yourself. So um, I give an example because I'm very familiar with the Black Knight. I'm going to tell you what components you need to build a Black Knight. So Black Knight has four flippers, so you need four uh, flipper mechanisms. It has one bumper, it has four three side-by-side -side drop target banks. It, it has a ball trough uh, mechanism that has two solenoids and uh, an eject a ball eject, but I, I, I put something different. This is a more modern uh, ball trough. Uh, obviously, you need a ball trough. You're going to need seven uh, rollover sensors. You need to need two uh, slingshots and um, uh, well, you're going to need a three ball lock mechanism that doesn't exist. Nobody sells that. And you need to go you need to buy um, a ball eject assembly like a hole, right? That it's in the in the lower floor. When you put together the prices of all of this is around a thousand dollars. If you put in pre-made electronics uh, like the electronic boards that you can buy today uh, in the market is around six hundred dollars total, I think. So you need sixteen hundred dollars just for the things that go underneath the playfield and the control electronics. And I'm not including the harness here in the calculation. The harness has another pain. If you look at the traditional wiring harness, uh, you have uh, all the uh, power that goes to the solenoids. Um, it's a 48 volt or a high voltage line uh, that goes uh, to each one of the coils and then the second line that goes to the coils is the one that is controlled by the power transistors and that goes to ground. So essentially um, there's a, a series of issues with uh, the solenoid uh, wiring. We have to be very careful. There can be a lot of uh, noise. So there's several methods to take care of that. Uh, and interference without inputs, right? Solenoids generate a lot of noise. The inputs to the processor boards, on the other hand, are the, again, they go to different type of connectors, they have different shapes, and uh, from the board to the, uh, to the sensor that is going to provide the input to the processor, uh, there's going to be wires of different lengths and you're going to have uh, different crimps that you have to do on the each one of the terminals. So that's a lot of work. So this is the traditional wiring harness. A traditional wiring harness has the control board and you're going to have, in the case of the input ports, right, we're talking, uh, wires that go to uh, from that uh, um, bunch of uh, lines that come of, of, of out of this, uh, of this port. You're going to have um, lines that go to uh, different mechanisms, different components, and they have different connectors. And this is an example. You have different connector types. You need different crimp tools. You have different wire thicknesses. You have different white lengths, and you have different white colors. So you had to buy all these things that adds up to the price. So another way to do things is instead of having each mechanism one type of connector that is different from all the others. You can use exactly the same type of connector. Uh, the same way, if you ever open the computer, you probably saw a flat cable, and the flat cable has, um, at regular intervals, they have the same type of connector. That connector is used using uh, a single um, a crimping tool, which is this one at the bottom, okay? So you save a lot of time, because you don't need different crimping tools you don't need different terminals, you don't need different connectors. So this is the, the way that I, uh, I propose in the, in the electronics design. Uh, I <laughs> what, what okay, H how much time I have? Five minutes? Okay, so um, anyways, uh, if you design your components, uh, you're going to end up uh, with a cost, estimated cost of, um, I'm going to give you the idea, $670. And the, 
design of the components, uh, it can be very, very professional. So I have a few samples that I'm going to show. So I think that what I'd like to do is I'm going to, I'd like to uh, give the components to the audience so they can see it, or you can come right now. Please stand up and come to see the components. Yeah, just mind, mind be mindful of the cables, but please come here to uh, closer and, and grab the components, touch it with your own hands, and you're going to understand that this is uh, very high quality stuff that you can do yourselves. Another thing is the, uh, the sensors that I use don't have leaf switches. Uh, leaf switches are a traditional thing that comes from this long time ago, from the 60s, they have uh, contacts that are um, expensive. Yeah, so in general, these are uh, all the components that you need to make a Black Knight, right? And my idea is to keep developing this and pro offer these to the home brewers at a much lower price that you can get in the traditional, traditional makers. And I think I'm done, right? Okay.